This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set. During the age of social distancing, we're recording remotely and releasing extra episodes. The dead walk behind me Though I do not recognize their faces I know they are here to remind me of the space Between the spaces I'm dreaming Today's guest is Johanna Warren, author of Haunting Songs, beautifully sung with an ethereal yet rhythmically adventurous delivery that elicits a modern-day Sandy Denny. Johanna and I met while working on the Netflix series The Midnight Gospel, on which she plays the singing voice of the prisoner. She spoke to me in May from her home in rural Wales. Mysteries of the universe What difference does it really make after all If we had another chance to do it right I'd give it all I have had Just like I did before when you left me with nothing at all Hello Hey, it's Joe Hey, Joe, it's Joe How's it going? <laughs> it's going so well, how are you doing? Not bad. Where are you? I'm in rural Wales. Do you live in Wales? I do now, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. When did you move? Um, I, I fled um, just as everything was locking down in the States. Um, I was prepared to embark on a European tour but that was clearly not going to happen. Um, but my sweetheart lives over here, and he was going to be traveling with me. But um, yeah, as the lockdown started escalating, he was already locked out of the States, so he couldn't come over there if I stayed there. So we just didn't want to risk being stuck in separate continents. So I just changed my ticket and came over here a couple weeks earlier than I'd planned, and now I'm chilling with a bunch of sheep and... <laughs> Uh, enjoying this strange little bucolic paradise. Are you staying on a farm? Essentially, it's um, it's like a farmhouse kind of out in the hills, surrounded by pastures uh, where different shepherds rotate their herds. So it's it's lambing season right now. So there's a lot of little babies hopping around, learning how to run down hills. It's very cute. Pre-Euro. Yeah. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, though. Like, I actually, I had never eaten lamb before because they are just so cute and, like, the embodiment of innocence. Um, but somehow, being surrounded by them here, I'm, my, I used to be a zealous vegan, but in recent years I've shifted towards um, just sort of very conscientious omnivorism and with a focus on local abundance and seasonal eating and just like whatever is growing rampant in your backyard. That's kind of what I, what I feel inclined to eat. So it's, it's strange being here. It's like when I look at what's locally abundant, it's a lot of sheep. So um, yeah, I had lamb for the first time in my life and it was, Unfortunately delicious. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the first thing that you ate when you broke your veganism? It was an elk steak. It was uh, several years ago. Um, I, I walked into my friend's place for a music rehearsal and he was frying up an elk that his friend's uncle had hunted and I, it was like my salivary glands just squirted. Like I just walked in the house and smelled that meat and was just, I just, my whole body was just overcome with this feeling of need. Um, and it was, it was interesting cause I was, you know, I was passionately vegan for a long time for ethical, spiritual reasons, but I was 
having a lot of health issues and going to see a lot of um, different alternative practitioners and they were all kind of telling me different things but the one thing that they all agreed on was you need to eat red meat <laughs> like a lot of red meat and I just was adamantly defiant of that and refused to even look into it but then yeah I had that moment where I, I smelled this elk steak and just knew like my body just needed it and I I ate some and it felt like this rush of vitamins that I had not had in my body for a decade um yep (laughs) 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 but it's I'm so sensitive to it like I really can't um be, even be around any kind of factory farmed meat and like cow in general makes me really sad. I feel just really sensitive to the energies of stuff, any kind of animal product, same with like milk and eggs. I can't, I can't do it if it's not from a happy, humanely sourced, uh, source. <laughs> um, cause yeah, it's just too much. Like I kind of just default to vegan if I don't know where things are coming from, but then if I have the choice between eating, you know, an egg from my neighbor's chicken, who I know is just hopping around living a happy chicken life versus like a GMO soybean from South America that's been sprayed with hella pesticides and has a massive carbon footprint. It's like, ugh, it's more complicated than we might want to think it is, you know? Yeah. It's interesting. I used to be vegan too. I was vegan and vegetarian for about 20 years. Mm. And then just became uh, more nihilistic and started eating meat. <laughs> like, I still <laughs> agree with all of the reasons why I was vegan and vegetarian. I just stopped um, having faith in fu- humanity's ability to save itself. It's kind of mm, dark. Wow. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's interesting is I don't feel any different eating like an in and out burger and fries than I do eating a a macrobiotic bowl, like with Mm. all organic ingredients. My body feels absolutely no difference. I mean, in aggregate, it might. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, because obviously, if if I eat fast food every day, I'd probably start feeling really gross after a while. But Mm. who knows? Acutely, I I don't. Yeah. Yeah, well, bless your heart. I I, I feel like we're all just so, we're built so differently. Like I I worked at this um, grass-fed burger restaurant in my early 20s and that was, I I was vegan at the time and I kind of, it was just, I was broke and just moved to this new small town. It was the only place that was hiring. (laughs) Um, But it was actually a really good experience for me. I, I, I had a lot of really challenging but important conversations with the guys running that restaurant and one of the things that um that uh the owner would always say was like people are just like cars some some models you need the ultra supreme you know whatever high quality high price gas and some you can just run on the most the the basic shit and it'll run forever and you know some people can just eat mcdonald's every day of their lives and live to be 120 and some people have like extreme sensitivities to everything and need to be you know super mindful about dietary restrictions and stuff so i'm a big believer in just doing whatever feels right to you and everybody's got different food karma and everybody's got different needs and sensitivities so god bless us everyone (laughs) So you must be like a luxury car that can only handle the high octane gasoline. I really or yeah, high I'm octane lamb <laughs> with maximum yeah. innocence. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, I've definitely been blessed and cursed with a lot of sensitivities. Um, which it's you know it's it is what it is. I at times definitely do envy people who can just eat whatever and not feel any effects. But I'm definitely, I feel everything like 10 miles away, like just looking at a plate of food. I can just, I just get this like really intense energetic effect from, from food. Just, I I don't know. Like it's, eating is such an intensely, um, emotional thing for me. And I think, 
see, I was, I was anorexic when I was a teenager and I've thought a lot about that because in one way I was just, I recognized that I was just totally brainwashed by mainstream media and just wanted to be skinny for that reason. But on another level, there's an interesting spiritual thing that was going on there, which was I was the food that I had available to me was not the food that I've come to realize I need to feel good. It was actually a lot of things that I was, that I had allergies to that I just energetically am repelled by. So I, there was something going on where I, I just, was not recognizing the food that was being offered to me as nourishment. So there was some kind of wisdom in me rejecting that at the time. And then it wasn't until I started working on farms and like growing my own food and interacting with the life cycles of things firsthand that I started actually wanting to eat. (laughs) Um, So that's really, yeah, I've I've thought a lot about that, about how, you know, some, uh, so many of the the basic facts of our food system are so disconnected from the way that things have always been until very recently and and some of us i think are probably someone like you i i think y'all are probably more well adapted to the modern way of life and that's you know it's an evolutionary strength but I'm kind of not fit for survival in the state of nature as it currently is. Like I, my DNA doesn't seem to have caught up yet. Like a lot of the modern innovations in agriculture and everything, I'm just like, it doesn't even register as food to my system. It's like, ah, this is some kind of crazy toxin and we're going to freak out and have some massive autoimmune apocalypse now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I, I love mean, that we I, just dove right into this. <laughs> well, let, let's go back. Where did you grow up? <laughs> um, so many places. I was born in Florida and moved around a bit. Uh, my dad was in academia and just kind of going going back to school for various degrees growing up. So I we hopped up and down the East Coast mostly, like, Florida, Massachusetts, Georgia, New York, and then I went out west as a young adult. I moved to Oregon and then California. What was your dad studying? History. Were your parents together the whole time you were growing up? Yeah. Yeah, they got married when they were teenagers, and they're still together. That's pretty uh, impressive and also uh, a lot to live up to. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, definitely unusual. Um, yeah, very beautiful. Is your mom involved in academia as well? No, she's an artist. Um, she's a very talented writer and um, illustrator. Was she doing that when you were growing up? Um, yeah, she hasn't really pursued it professionally. Like it's more of just like her passion. She was she was in um uh the film world for a little bit. Like they my parents met in Florida and moved out to California as young people, a young couple, and my mom was doing like assistant art direction on a couple movies. Um, but then they decided they wanted to have a family and I think she was not really feeling the Hollywood vibes. She was just kind of uh, turned off by a a lot of what she was seeing out there. So she, they went back to Florida to start a family and like be close to their parents. And, um, my dad went back to school to be a teacher to like support the family. So my mom was a stay at home mom and then yeah, she's just been kind of researching a lot and like pursuing her her art in a sort of private way. Were your parents music fans? My dad definitely. Yeah, they they bonded over the Beatles. Like I think they have this shared profound love for the Beatles that was like a big part of their relationship. Um and my dad is definitely an avid music listener and a musician himself he he plays piano and sings 
um, yeah, he has a real, a real gift, like a really amazing ear. Um, and yeah, he, he listens to a lot of great music and turned me on to a lot of great music at a young age. Yeah. What kind of music was on in the house? Um, oh, all the classics, um, a lot of Tom Petty on road trips, <laughs> um, uh, the Beatles for sure, some Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, um, Paul Simon, Bonnie Raitt, uh, Talking Heads, um, yeah, so much, so much good stuff. Some Joni Mitchell. I think my mom used to not like Joni Mitchell, and I I kind of agreed with her at a young age. But then there, like when I got when I turned maybe like twelve or thirteen, I was like, "What the fuck is this? <laughs> Where has this been all my life?" And my dad was like, "I played it uh, on every road trip, and you always told me to turn it off." <laughs> your mom poisoned your mind against Joni. <laughs> <laughs> It's the patriarchy internalized. <laughs> they want us to rip each other apart. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, your dad was the one playing it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, like the way that women kind of internalize misogyny and like don't, uh, don't even. I feel like I've I've had to do a lot of work to learn how to love women artists because of the feelings of jealousy and comparison that it used to elicit um or just yeah just internalized misogyny you know is it more intense or was it more intense than feelings of healthy competition towards perhaps male artists mm. um yeah definitely more intense when did you start playing music it was definitely an instinctive proclivity as a young kid, but then it got squashed by myself, really. <laughs> I just, I became really um, self conscious and afraid of using my voice. So there was a period when I was just practically a mute, like socially and yeah, in school, like I just wouldn't even talk and then singing was something very private that I would do when I was alone in my house you know when my mom would go grocery shopping and my siblings weren't home I would like stand at the piano and like wail and practice Broadway musical songs and stuff and just but it was something that I never wanted anyone to hear um, and then it came back around in late high school. I started writing little songs and playing at open mics and stuff. But it was definitely a period of forgetting and then remembering. For the period of forgetting, was there an event that led you to that place? I've thought about that a lot. I don't know. I, I can't really remember one specific inciting incident, except there was, like... The one thing that stands out was when I was really young, I was in my room. I have two brothers, and we all shared a room up to a certain point. Um, and I was I was looking out the window at this little bird and singing to the bird. And then my brother was watching me through the door and just started, like, snickering and saying, <laughs> Nice song! <laughs> and I just remember this feeling of just burning shame that just, you know, because I was having this sweet little moment by myself and then just, you know, the the bubble getting burst when you realize that someone is observing you and then laughing and judging you, um, that it just like crushed something within me. <laughs> and I think that was maybe the beginning of that feeling of self-consciousness, but I don't know. Um, hmm. Yeah, it must have been, there must have been a sensitivity there, you know, before your brother made that comment, that the comment might have just pushed you over the edge or not. Yeah. It might have. Yeah. I, I can remember similar things in my life. Like, I liked singing from a young age, and when I was six, I auditioned for a 
a community musical and it, um, I had practiced by myself, but then when I was auditioning, I had a complete meltdown. <laughs> oh. Later, there was a time, that, kind of like your story, where I was singing in my room and a friend of mine was coming over. I didn't realize he had been listening to me and he was like, was that you singing? And I was like, no, it wasn't. <laughs> this mm-hmm. was probably when I was about eight or something. Um, mm. So I don't know. I think when I think back to myself, I think I was always just insecure about it or something. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like there was just always this feeling from a super young age of just being, being too much for the world or like just not belonging here and just, just having some, some feeling of like being on a hostile alien planet that was not my home. And I've had to really work to make earth feel like home and commit to being here and like carve out a place that feels comfortable and good and find my people. It's been a real journey. Um, And I think the voice is such a, such an intense um, psycho spiritual instrument that's so psychological and just, um, you know, it's this, the throat, it's like the bridge between the heart and the mind, you know, and so much, I think I've never met a person who doesn't have some kind of uh, energetic blockage there, you know, cause it's, it's so vulnerable too. It's just, just hanging right out there. So exposed and so, Um, yeah, so fragile. I want to get back to this thought of feeling like an alien on your own world. (laughs) Mm. What are some other ways that that feeling manifested? Mm. One of my earliest memories is just walking around our suburban neighborhood with my mom when I was probably three or four and um, just holding her hand and walking around our neighborhood at night and just looking at all the houses and thinking, why is this the way it is? And how did this happen? How, like, why are the houses square when they could be any shape? And um, just, I don't know, this kind of profound feeling for a three-year-old to have, you know, just like, this This could be anything, you know, we could have made any choices and why are we doing it this way why is everything kind of so boring and uniform and rectangular (laughs) um so yeah there's always just been a kind of sense of um wanting to break that apart a little bit and wanting to like it feels like a remembering of another way that I came into the world with like this Ah, like this doesn't have to be so fucking frustrated and boring. Like it, we could just make different choices, and it could look completely differently. And that that feeling that I don't think, obviously, I didn't have the vocabulary to put any of that into words as a three year old. But I just remember that feeling that has just followed me through my entire life. And now, as an adult, I do feel like I have words for it. And it's like we have no shortage of energy and resources and abundance available to us and it's just we've made some weird choices and energy's flowing in some uh misguided directions but we can change that you know we it's just a matter of redirecting the flow and 
um, reeling some stuff back in and casting it out in different directions. But I just never buy it when people say, you know, any kind of arguments about like, oh, we couldn't do that because we don't have enough blank. You know, it's like we have so much. We have so much just raw, abundant power in the form of human energy and solar energy and untapped psychic energy and we can do whatever we want <laughs> and it's just uh yeah it's just there's some really old stories that are still running them running themselves and uh they just need to be reprogrammed but i feel like that's happening right i don't know <laughs> I honestly don't know. I mean, like I said, <laughs> I lost some faith in humanity uh, mm. a while ago. But I Did don't know. It's coming back, maybe. Mm. Did something happen to to you to at, th- at that juncture to make you lose faith? I don't know that there was a single incident, but I just, you know, over time, it, I, I came to believe that it's in our very nature to build those square houses and build factory farms. It's almost as if that's what we're designed to do as a species. Mm. Like maybe our greatest achievement is littering the planet with plastic and then we'll go extinct and some other more evolved species (laughs) will come along and eat the plastic and breathe Mm. smog. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's definitely already happening. Have you heard that there are microorganisms in the ocean that have evolved to eat plastic? I have, and I think some scientists are trying to study those organisms and figure out if there's a way to, you know, kind of pro- mass produce them or replicate that technology to help, mm-hmm. uh, you know, metabolize that plastic into something more biological. Yeah. Yeah, anything is possible. And that's I I take comfort in remembering that it's all nature and we are a part of nature too as much as we try to separate ourselves from it. Even right. the plastic, you know, no matter how artificial a technology might seem, it's all It's not artificial, it's a product of a of us and we're a exactly. product of the world. So it's exactly. almost just like Bees make honey, humans make smog. (laughs) Yeah. You know. Yeah, and nature is smarter than us, and I think it will figure itself out in some way or another, and it might involve humanity as we know it becoming extinct or morphing into an unrecognizable future species, but that's cool. That's just it's what's been happening for forever on this planet, you know? It used to be ruled by dinosaurs. Now we're here. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question is, um, how much agency do we have over what we do at the time that we have here? And there's a lot of opportunity to be more compassionate and to build a more equitable world. Mm. And uh, I think we're missing out on lots of those opportunities. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it's true. And I think that's... um I just did another interview this morning where... um, Is this an interview? Oh, I don't know. (laughs) What do you call it? (laughs) A conversation? A conversation. (laughs) Um, I just had another conversation this morning about um, disease uh, as a teacher. And I feel like what I did not say in that conversation is on a collective level, I feel like we're experiencing disease and dis disorder that is just an invitation to make adjustments and if we can kind of reframe it and see it that way it's it can become a really positive thing because when you when something is out of balance and you make a correction to move back towards a state of greater balance that's that's nature and biological life in a nutshell that's what we're all doing is trying to move towards homeostasis and things change things are always in flux and always trying to work their way back towards balance so right now things are fucking really out of balance but 
that's our cue to start moving back and remembering and and it feels good you know like every little step that's why I I've been feeling in this quarantine times is like oh wow like not being on tour right now feels so good and waking up and walking outside and touching the earth with my feet feels so good and like these are simple pleasures that I've I've been deprived of for a long time living in the kind of fast-paced modern matrix and um it's I've been suffering the consequences of that in my own body and I think we're all suffering the consequences collectively but it's not a the future is certainly not set in stone and the present is not set in stone because there are always you know when we feel that kind of um anxiety or so any kind of symptomatic expression of the imbalance, whether it's a headache or some kind of chronic pain or whatever, it's um, it's an invitation to try something else that'll that might feel really good and might actually lead you to something really cool that you didn't even know you might have a passion for, or like a really cool person that might be holding the key to your healing mysteries. I've heard from lots of artists in the last several weeks that they are relieved not to be on tour right now. And I've also heard of, you know, just a general kind of fatigue or dissatisfaction with the album cycle model. Mm. And, Mm. you know, if you think about it, the album cycle is, it's a remnant from a time when people would buy albums to the extent that a tour was essentially a promotional (laughs) write-off, you know, business-wise. Have you thought about ways that you might want to change your way of doing business as an artist or interacting with the world? Hell yeah. Um, Yeah, like, I've been on the road a lot in the last decade uh pretty much I'd say at least half and half like on the road as much as being in one place and um it's been such a mixed bag you know it's been beautiful I'm grateful for so much like it's taught me so much and freed me from so much and um more than anything, the way that I've done it, it's it's taught me so much about generosity and the goodness of people because I've been traveling alone a lot um, and uh, really relying on the kindness of strangers being taken in by people I've never met before and really, you know, putting myself in a very vulnerable position but being constantly just so supported and held and taken care of by such beautiful people everywhere so that's been a revelation and I'm I love it but the downside for me has just been um pushing my physical body beyond beyond the limits of what is humane and acceptable to do to a human body just the the traveling every day just moving from one city to another every single day it's just it's insane and it's definitely not um, environmentally friendly. And that hypocrisy has bothered me a lot. Like just knowing that I'm kind of living really out of balance with my own um, ethics and ideals. So, and, you know, financially too, it's real interesting because I think it's a trap. You know, I have definitely thought, I'm a professional musician. I need to be touring if I'm going to make any money. But the catch-22 is touring is fucking expensive. So if you're going to be flying or driving every single day, that's a lot of expenses right there. And then eating out three times a day, Um, uh, you know, traffic tickets, uh, parking tickets, like, break-ins, um, buying things that you wouldn't need to buy if you had a home. It's all, you know, you're not paying rent sometimes, but you're, it racks up, um, its own expenses. So I'm realizing 
in the just in this like last six weeks of being forced to be in one place my bank account is <laughs> staying put you know and I'm not making money but I'm also not spending a ton of money so it's it's been um shocking to me like at first I was like what am I going to do the touring is my livelihood but then I've, I've been realizing oh it's my it's also the monkey on my back you know touring is massively expensive and I've kind of just been treading water for a decade you know I haven't been I definitely haven't been putting anything away in savings it's like I'll tour my ass off for six months and come home and barely be able to make rent so <laughs> it's just hilarious to me looking back that I thought it was something that I had to do for financial reasons it's like I could have just stayed home and sold some shit on Etsy and <laughs> come out way ahead so it's really, I think, been this more more like a pride-based um, crusade to prove to myself and the world that I'm succeeding as a professional musician when really it's a, a fool's errand. Well, there's also this notion that you have to pay your dues and that For sure. in order to qualify as a musician, you have to go through that period of sleeping on floors and driving mm -hmm. in a van from place to place every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's like hazing. I mean, I think, I don't know that that's necessarily true. I've, I've spoken to so many people and some of them and, you know, legitimately enjoy touring in a DIY style for their entire career. Other people never go through the hazing period and achieve massive success from the jump. You know, it, it's 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 certainly not a requirement, but there is this idea that there should be some amount of suffering involved in order to make it legit. Yeah, which is so yeah. I feel like that permeates beyond music. It's just kind of this weird Judeo Christian thing of like suffering equals goodness. It's interesting, isn't it, that like Christianity has fixated on the crucifixion, you know, more than anything. It's like, well, he he did a lot of really rad shit when he was alive, like you know, telling everybody to love each other and <laughs> not uh, not kill each other. But then it's that image of the suffering that is burned in everybody's collective mind as though that's the greatest thing he ever did. And that's always been confusing to me. I found you lost in space. I tried to pull you out. It's not my job, not my place to give a damn about it. But I saw them in the shadows. I tried to warn you. I know it's not my battle, but I'm a war. It's obvious that suffering is inevitable, right? So why bring on more? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's it's going to happen. It's part of life. But it's not the only currency with which you can be an artist. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really damaging um, uh, archetype stereotype of like the the struggling artist the starving artist because I know I remember distinctly a moment when I was probably 13 and had just in the last couple of years just discovered Elliot Smith and Nirvana and um those were kind of those were the people that I had posters of up on my walls like Kurt Cobain Elliot Smith um and I remember taking a walk with my brother and telling him, I feel like I, I need to fuck my life up. <laughs> like, I want to be a musician, so I need to fuck my life up. 
And um, that really, that was the beginning of this like terrible downward spiral of um, real mental illness. Like I feel like I really successfully manifested mental illness for myself. You think you willed it onto yourself or did, were you predisposed to, mm. to it and you just, and that's why you, people like Kurt Cobain or Elliot Smith resonated with you? Mm. Ah, chicken or the egg. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I, I think probably both. I mean, I was definitely, definitely from a super young age, just predisposed to bouts of hysterical sadness. Like just even as a one-year-old, two-year-old, three-year-old, I would just have these um, tidal waves of emotion overtake me. And like my my parents were so uh, completely unequipped to know what to do with a screaming child that is inconsolable like it I think it was really really hard on them because I would just it, nothing there was no clear trigger it would just come on like I would just have these fits and um uh so yeah there was always that heavy deep dark sadness that would come upon me but I think I definitely remember making a conscious decision to start styling myself differently and like like I um I was a really nerdy kid in late elementary school and early middle school like just hopelessly hopelessly nerdy and then I I changed schools in eighth grade and I realized like no one would know who I was or who I had been so I had this opportunity to reinvent myself and that was the year that um, the Royal Tenenbaums had come out, the Wes Anderson movie. And um, have you seen it? Mm-hmm. So Margot Tenenbaum was just this vision for me, this beacon of who I wanted to be. Was so that the I Gwyneth went, Paltrow character? For sure. Yeah. So I went to the thrift store and bought clothes that I thought looked like stuff that Margot Tenenbaum would wear and um, went to CVS and stole an eyeliner pen (laughs) and just went crazy with the black eyeliner and rolled up to my first day of eighth grade, just a completely transformed human being and just played this part, you know, and it stuck. It was like, I'm a pretty good actress, I think. And I've convinced everyone, including myself, that I was, um, Margot Tenenbaum. <laughs> well, this kind of gets back to what you were talking about before, where you felt out of place in the world. And so you were kind of searching for an identity to to try on at that point, huh? Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I, yeah, I, I had no idea what I was doing, just totally flailing. But I saw her in that movie and was just like, that looks good. That looks like a mask that I can put on that will help me survive space helmet. You mentioned that you started writing music and playing music again when you were in high school. Mm. What kind of stuff were you doing then? Uh, comedy, <laughs> comedy songs. They were, um, I think because I was too self-conscious to, too, yeah, too self-conscious to try to make a sincere statement. I just, um, yeah, I wrote these really kind of twee comedy songs about like the the apocalypse coming and um, floating to safety in the Loch Ness monster's vagina. <laughs> 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 and yeah, that was like I, I I co-wrote some songs with my best friend Francis, and she and I would perform these things with our high school open mic and that that song was like the what was it called the something something story of edwin slappy jones which we decided was the loch ness monster's real name Ad, edwin slappy jones slappy in quotation marks um <laughs> so yeah that was the kind of shit i was writing <laughs> you're not all that far from loch ness now it's true. I know. And there is an apocalypse happening. 
it was all prophecy. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> Did you know what you wanted to do with your life at that point? Were you admitting to yourself that you wanted to be a musician? No way. No, I had no idea. I like I I was doing so many things. Um I knew I wanted to be an artist, I think, but I was mostly um mostly doing visual art really up to a point that's what I studied in college and what I kind of was the most um praised for and I think that so you know you just kind of do what people tell you you're good at and I was uh technically very proficient at visual arts like I could always just kind of draw things the way that they looked but the thing was I never really had a a vision in that department like I never really felt like I could express anything um emotional through that channel it was more of a draftsmanship like a technical ability but I was being kind of pushed in that direction by my parents and my teachers because I just I definitely had like an exceptional um talent for it from a, a young age so that's that if anything I would have just yeah guessed that I would have done that but I was also really into acting and writing and kind of a science nerd actually like I, I for a while I thought I wanted to be a neuroscientist and specifically study dreams because I always had really crazy dreams from a young age so I, I and do you I, still I, I do yeah um, they kind of come in waves but they've always been a big a big deal for me like um sometimes way more interesting than waking life what's a how about you what's your dream life like uh i don't really i'm not that aware of my dreams right now mm. i mean i can remember certain dreams that i've had over the course of my life like i can't even remember dreams i had when i was a toddler wow um i don't know if it's just my mind reconstructing that as a memory, mm. but it feels like a legitimate memory. Um, so cool. But yeah, I actually have trouble sleeping these days. Mm. Is it like your mind can't turn off kind of thing? Maybe it's that. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, uh, uh, I think I'm having some sleep apnea, experiencing some sleep apnea, so I'm probably going to get that checked out <laughs> when, yeah. when the medical system is less taxed. Right. Hmm. Um, I have struggled with insomnia a lot at various points, and I don't know if you're interested in this kind of thing, but one herb that I've found that's really helpful for me with Sleep is um, ashwagandha. Um, it's it's like a, an Ayurvedic herb, um, and the the Latin name is Withania somnifera. So um, that's indicative of its uh, somniferous qualities. So um, it's really it's it's an amazing adaptogenic herb. So it's like if you're struggling to stay awake or feel energized during the day, it'll give you an energy boost actually. But then if you take it uh, a strong dose before you go to sleep, it'll just put you out. Um, so that's, yeah, that's been my life saving herbal ally for sleep trouble. I'll have to check it out. Yeah. Highly recommend. If you were to go through a time portal and take your three-year-old self on a walk through the suburbs, what would you <laughs> tell that person when she asks you why the world is built this way? Mm, wow. Hmm. I think I would say something like people have made choices and these are the choices that people have made and the the all the choices have accumulated and added up to this but we can make new choices and that's why you're here <laughs> to help us make new choices what would you say to the um tenenbaum version of yourself the margot tenenbaum version of yourself with the oh. stolen eyeliner 
Oh, baby. And the no. eating disorder. <laughs> oh, my God. Just, oh, just come here. I would just give her a giant hug and stroke her hair and tell her she's beautiful and it's going to be okay. <laughs> would she listen to you? I don't know. I don't know. She, yeah, who knows? She might have been... I don't know. I like to think that if I now met her then, that I would know how to reach her. But I feel like at the time I was surrounded by people who had no idea how to reach me. And that just led me to act out in more and more extreme ways because I felt like I was screaming and no one could hear me. So I was just screaming louder and louder. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah. So when did you start to feel like you were surrounded by people that heard you? Mm. I mean, that's a presumptuous question, but it seems like you've, you've gotten to a different place in your life. For sure. Um, I mean, it definitely required me to change internally um, pretty dramatically. I mean, whatever stories you tell about yourself to yourself – those are things that you sometimes seek to reinforce by surrounding yourself with people that will agree with those stories. Absolutely. And people, you know, like my parents, for instance, I, when I was a teenager, I just felt so at odds with them and we really just couldn't communicate. There was such a blockage, but since I've been doing just a massive overhaul on my self and my inner world um we've become such good friends and like we have so much in common and so much to talk about and I feel like I know that they've changed and I've changed and we were just different people 10 years ago and 20 years ago but I also know that we're all such um mirrors and so reactive to each other and like so interdependent and like I was in such an extreme state that they were having the reactions they were having to that which I was then reacting to and it just becomes this echo chamber of feedback you know and um and if I wasn't having the experiences I was having they wouldn't have had the reactions to those experiences that they had and vice versa so it's, you know, it's like everyone is responsible for their own behaviors and choices. And, um, and yet I feel like I'm, I guess I'm at a, a place where I'm ready to just take responsibility for all my experiences and all my relationships. And, and, you know, like if someone is, um, if someone is unable to meet me in the kind of place that I want to meet, that's fine. And I'm not going to like beat myself up for it or take the blame for something that someone else is going through, but I can, um, I can decide to walk away from someone who's mistreating me. And if I see myself choosing to stay in a situation that's clearly not good for me, I can recognize, Oh, that's a choice that I'm making. You know, no one is doing this to me. I'm choosing to be here and like, why is that? What am, what am I getting out of this? You know? So um, what was your question? I feel like I've wandered into it. Well, I think you kind of answered it in a more interesting way than I posed it. So I was asking about <laughs> how you, or when you started to feel as though you were heard, but it sounds ah. like you did some work and then started to recognize that you you were partially responsible for surrounding yourself yes. with people that you resonated with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and responsible for, um, not speaking clearly, you know, it's like I, I could just keep screaming nonsense and, uh, pitying myself because no one can hear me or I can change my approach and, uh, you know, start kind of tending to my own, needs and hearing myself and learning, adapting, like, okay, like this is you going back to the alien planet metaphor, like learning the language a little bit and realizing, oh, I can 
learn to communicate here and I can and then use the language, use the native tongue to express what I came here to say. You know, I don't need to get completely, I don't need to lose myself and forget who I am, but I can make some adjustments to uh, enable communication. Drinking blood from the stump of a prison guard that I just chopped up That used to be freedom to me Watching my cellmate cry as I sprayed hot piss in his gouged out eyes That used to be freedom to me We met because I was the composer on Midnight Gospel and you were the voice of the prisoner for the prisoner yeah. song. <laughs> but then subsequently I've dove into your body of solo work and you recently released your newest album, Chaotic Good, yes. which is really good. Right. Was there any discussion as to whether or not now was the right time to put it out into the world? Did you think about delaying it until after quarantine? Um, there might have been a brief email exchange, but I think I, yeah, I definitely felt like, um, unattached to the touring and as long as, as long as the label was cool with it, like I definitely wanted to check in with them and ask if they were cool with it from a financial standpoint, since obviously it's, you know, they invested money in making records and my end of the deal involved me going on tour to sell the records, you know. So I definitely wanted to check in with them and make sure they still felt like it was it made sense from their perspective, but um I and we were all in agreement that it's it's a great time to put art out into the world because everybody's home and got a lot of time to look at things and listen to things. So um yeah, there wasn't really any kind of push and pull there. So everybody that's stuck home right now should check out your new album, Chaotic Good. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and they can they can still purchase it directly from you on Bandcamp, correct? This is true. Yep. And it's available on LP and CD, as Indeed. well as streaming. Yes. Yeah. It's, uh it's pretty cool, uh, translucent red vinyl, which is a new thing for me. <laughs> Johanna, thank you so much for being on the show. My extreme pleasure. Have a beautiful evening. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com.